one, three. Sir, we are live now. Now we can start. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to today's webinar uh, brought to you by the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation uh, through Ortho TV. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Dhiren Ganjwala. I think by now he needs no introduction. He's been uh, giving many talks on this uh, on these sessions. And today he's going to talk about limb length discrepancy, how you assess them, and what are your principles of management. So over to you, Dhiren. I'm sure it'll be an excellent talk as usual. Yeah, I think my slides are visible, right? Yeah, you can see them clearly. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. This lecture is basically focused for or is targeted to postgraduate students. So the aim of this talk is not to answer all the questions which you have, but I will try to explain things in such a way that this lecture will inspire you to ask more questions. And that's what I want. If you have any question, please free to ask the moderator and we will definitely discuss the questions. So what points we are going to cover? There are five important points which we would like to discuss in this. The first is the types of limb length discrepancy. The second question is, or the second point is how to assess the limb length discrepancy. The third is how body compensate for the limb length discrepancy. So if we don't manage a uh, limb length discrepancy, in that case, how body will take care of that? And what are the long-term consequences of that, that we will understand. The fourth point mm -hmm. is uh, again, the long-term effects, which is very important for exam point of view, because the examiner will always ask you, why we really need to correct it or why a small amount of limb length discrepancy cannot be uh, can be managed without uh, any surgical treatment and the last point is about management i don't want to like cover everything in hurry so whatever is possible we will try to cover in the 40 minutes slot whatever is remaining we will take in the second session in the future so let's go to the first point and there is a time uh, that's a type of limb length discrepancy. Some people call it LLD as a limb length difference also. So both terminology conveys the same thing, limb length discrepancy or difference. So there are two broad category of limb length discrepancy. The first is apparent and the second one is the true. Both the terminology are very clear. By apparent, we mean or we understand that there is no limb length discrepancy but it appears that the limb is short the second variety is true in which definitely there is a difference in the limb length between the two sides and that really causes problem to the patient so let us first understand apparent limb length discrepancy usually this is in a short duration all of a sudden it appears and man, many of the patients they present to us which says that my child was absolutely all right before few days. And because of some problem in the hip joint, now there is a limb length discrepancy. So that definitely tells us that this is apparent limb length discrepancy. What are the reasons or what are the causes of apparent limb length discrepancy? This is very important for the exam point of view. The first is there is a hip abduction deformity means of the two hips one hip is having a abduction deformity means the further adduction is not possible so let us understand how hip abduction deformity causes a problem so as shown over here the right hip is having a abduction deformity because of that the one thigh or the leg remains abducted now when child is lying down, this is okay. But when child wants to stand and walk, what happens? These two thighs or the limbs, they become parallel, they become vertical. Because there is an abduction deformity, the hip cannot be adducted, the right hip cannot be adducted, and that causes the tilting of pelvis. So let's see that this is abduction deformity, and while standing, the pelvis tilt. The most important thing is that if you look at, at the knee level, you can see that the left limb appear short or right limb appear longer. 
over and above that because of the pelvic tilt there is a scoliosis at the spinal level at the lumbar spine level so that's the first cause of the deformity the second cause is hip adduction deformity so let us understand how that adduction deformity causes limb length discrepancy so as shown over here the right hip has a adduction deformity because of some pathology the hip remains in adducted position and beyond neutral hip abduction is not possible so this is while the child is lying down now when the same child or the person gets up stands up and tries to walk this is what happens the two thighs they try to become parallel and vertical to the ground and that results into the tilting of pelvis now on the right side we can see that the pelvis has gone up and that leads to a apparent shortening so this is the second cause hip abduction deformity causes apparent shortening again there is a scoliosis at the upper level the third cause is the problem is in the lumbar spine there is a scoliosis at the lumbar level and that results into pelvic obliquity not all scoliosis will cause pelvic obliquity but those who are in the lumbar area or the lower lumbar area will cause pelvic obliquity and that also leads to limb length discrepancy which is apparent variety so the next picture will make us clear that here there is a lower lumbar scoliosis and that has caused a tilting of the pelvis now both lower limbs are of the equal length but because pelvis is tilted that again leads to a apparent limb length discrepancy so that's the third cause of limb, apparent limb length discrepancy coming to the fourth cause is hip or knee fixed flexion deformity to understand that let us see this the person is lying in this position the hip knees are straight now we can see that suppose there is a flexion deformity at the knee joint or flexion deformity at the hip joint this will appear as a short if we keep the vertical line from center of the hip we can see that on the upper part the limb appears short so this is the fourth cause of limb length discrepancy and the fifth one is ankle equinus to understand that uh, this is a patient who is in a vertical uh, vertical position the hip knee and the ankle they are in neutral position but suppose there is a equinus at the ankle then we can see that that limb appears longer so there are five causes of apparent limb length discrepancy the first is hip abduction deformity the second is hip adduction deformity the third is lumbar scoliosis the fourth is hip or knee fixed flexion deformity and the last is ankle equinus so if we look at the first three causes are in the coronal plane or in a frontal plane while the fourth and the fifth causes they are in sagittal plane now the next question which is very important uh, to understand and based on these understanding the clinical examination is carried out so we saw that there are five causes of apparent limb length discrepancy so i want you to think about like what will be the effect of this on the anterior superior iliac spine or on the pelvis so we will not spend much time but the answer is the first three that is hip abduction deformity hip adduction deformity and the lumbar scoliosis will cause tilting or asymmetrical height of the anterior superior iliac spine while the sagittal plane problems that is hip and knee flexion deformity or the ankle equinus will not have any effect at anterior superior iliac spine this is very important because when we try to analyze the limb length discrepancy by clinical examination we need to understand this point we come to the second variety that is true limb length discrepancy 
as shown in figure, you can see that the right side of the limb, lower limb, is shorter than the other one. So that's the true. Again, this can be divided into two variety. The first is the one limb is short. This is something like uh, if these are two finger and one is short, the other may look longer, but the one limb may be longer. Or sometimes there is a combination of both. One limb is shorter and the other is longer. And ultimately both contribute to the limb length discrepancy. So first point, causes of shortening. Which are the conditions which causes limb shortening? The first cause we see in a pediatric patient that there is a limb length discrepancy from childhood. And that is because of the abnormal bone formation. Femoral dysplasia or the tibial dysplasia will lead to this condition. The second cause is developmental conditions in which the developmental dysplasia of the hip, which is now called DDH, in the past we used to call it CDH, is another cause of shortening. The third is the traumatic in which Either there is an overriding of the fragment or there is a combination and that heals with the shortening or sometimes there is a growth arrest which leads to a shortening of that limb. Infective pathology when it affects growth plate will lead to shortening. Similarly, growth arrest because of another uh, any other condition like infection or the trauma can also cause shortening. Neurological conditions, when it affects one side, particularly like polio, which is maybe affecting both sides, but one side is more affected, a hemiplegic cerebral palsy or a spina bifida, these are the conditions where there is asymmetrical neurological involvement. The more affected side is short. Avascular necrosis of the femoral head will also cause collapse of the femoral head and that will lead to shortening. And sometimes the post-surgical, the common one is an adult patient who has undergone hemiarthroplasty. And because of that, too much of uh, taking out of the femoral neck will cause shortening. So these are the common cause of shortening, which we see in practice. Few clinical examination, a child with a proximal focal femoral deficiency this is a 3D CT reformat that gives us an idea that femur is short and that leads to limb length discrepancy. This is untreated DDH or the developmental dysplasia of the hip. Again, the hip lies higher up and that leads to shortening. The third one is this child had a physical injury at upper end of the tibia that was fixed but after uh, like two, over, uh, two years, the parent observed that there is a discrepancy in the limb length and that was because of the physical growth arrest at the proximal tibia. So that is a third variety or the third cause of limb length discrepancy. Now we come to the second uh, variety which we see in the true limb length discrepancy that one limb is long. There are few conditions which causes lengthening or the limb to become long. The one is post-traumatic, particularly that we see in a pediatric patient when they have a fracture femur, which leads to temporary or for next few months, the overgrowth of the affected limb and that may lead to lengthening. Some tumor increase the vascularity of the part and that also causes lengthening. And the third is infective pathology that causes lengthening. These three conditions have un one common pathway and that is increased vascularity of the segment leads to lengthening. Please remember that these conditions will cause lengthening only in children. The fourth variety is iatrogenic and usually the fracture neck femur in which the fixation is carried out either in too much of valgus that will lead to uh, this deformity. Or sometimes there is an impacted fracture neck femur that also leads to lengthening. So these are the conditions or the causes which leads to lengthening. 
Then we come to another very important practical point, and that is assessment of the limb length discrepancy. This is very important for exam point of view. So we will try to understand from a very basic point of uh, view so that the concept become very clear to you. So the first point is what information do we look for when we are examining the child or a person with a limb length discrepancy? What information we are looking for? We are looking for the first, we want to decide whether it's a true limb length discrepancy or apparent limb length discrepancy. That's the first point we want to assess. The second point is we want to quantify how much is the limb length discrepancy. The third question is which segment, whether the problem is in the femur, whether it is in tibia or whether it is in the foot. Most of us have an idea that the problem is either in femur or tibia and most of us we neglect foot. But I always try to emphasize because it's very important that foot may also be the cause of limb length discrepancy. So that's the third point, which segment is affected. And the fourth point is, what is the cause of limb length discrepancy? Because parents are always want to know why this happened. So for them, the cause is also important. So these are the four points, the type of limb length discrepancy, the quantum of limb length discrepancy, where is the problem? And the last is the cause. Now, how can we assess a child so that we get answer to all these questions? The process or the method which I am going to describe is a technique which I have evolved by like thinking. And I would like to ex uh, explain the methodology so that all the four points are uh, like we are able to assess them properly. So the first is like we carry out clinical examination. Then we need to go for imaging to exactly quantify the amount of limb length discrepancy. For that, we need a special scanogram if uh, or the like uh, x-ray where the person x-ray is taken in a standing position, the full from hip to ankle are covered in that particular x-ray. And the third, if that facility is not available, in that case, we go for CT scan. Let us understand the clinical examination in more detail. The first question, which a very basic question, in the textbook, they have described that you carry out the assessment of the limb length by having one point of the mesial tap at the umbilicus and second point at the medial malleolus. So that is one method. The second method is you keep the first point of the mesial tap at the ASIS, anterior superior leg spine, and the second point at the medial malleolus. So that's the confusion, like when one should use umbilicus as a starting point and when one should use anterior superior iliac spine. So to answer that question, when we are looking for apparent limb length discrepancy, in that case, we need to start from the umbilicus. When there is a true limb length discrepancy, in that case, we need to start from the anterior superior iliac spine. So that's what we are uh, trying to assess. We will not go into the detail why we do like that. But this is the simple understanding that for apparent limb length discrepancy, we keep the first point at the umbilicus. And for the true limb length, we keep it at ASIS. ASIS is basically representing the center of the femoral head or the center of the hip because that's the nearest bony landmark, which is apparent or prominent in almost palpable in almost every patient. Whatever may be the weight of that patient, ASIS is easily palpable. Now, let's understand the step-by-step -step process. So, how I do it? The first, I look at, at both the malleoli, the medial malleoli, or, or the sole of the feet. The best is to look at the sole of the foot and to see and to uh, ask the question, is there any limb length discrepancy? If 
the limb length discrepancy is present. The next step, we try to look at, at anterior superior iliac spine. What we look at at that, whether the right and the left ESIS, they are at the same level or not. If they are at not same level, then there are three possibilities. The first, there is an abduction deformity at the hip joint or there is a adduction deformity at the hip joint or there is a lumbar scoliosis. So for that, we need to make the patient sit. That is one way or we need to abduct or adduct the hip so that ASIS, they become horizontal, they become at the same level. So when we try to do, and if we can make ASAS at the same level, then the next step is we need to look at, at hip, knee, and ankle for the flexion deformity or for the plantar flexion deformity at the ankle joint. Now, if there is no deformity at the hip, knee, or ankle, in that case, we can conclude that this limb length discrepancy is not of apparent variety, but it's a true limb length discrepancy. Once we ensure, once we differentiate between the apparent and the true limb length discrepancy, the next is we measure the limb length from anterior superior iliac spine or we carry out a block test. What is block test? Suppose this girl is having a one limb short. This is left limb uh, we are looking from behind. If that is short, we try to keep the block underneath the foot so that pelvis become square. So that is a block test. Gradually we increase so that pelvis become equal. And height of the blocks that tells us that this is the amount of limb length discrepancy. There is another method or a better method and a more reliable method or an accurate method that is tele rongenogram. Tele means long. So this is how the x-ray is taken. To give you the detail, the person is standing. The yellow is a cassette in which there are three films are kept. The cassette height is 51 inch or 130 centimeter. The X-ray tube, usually we keep it at one meter distance, but here it is kept at 10 feet or almost 3.3 meter distance. And then X-ray is taken like this. So this will give us a complete X-ray from hip to ankle joint. If this X-ray facility is not available, because there are many centers in India where this facility is not available, in that case, if CT scan is available, then we can take a scanogram with the help of CT scan. But remember, this will give you the standing information, while in CT scan, we get information in known weight bearing position. So then comes the question, how to measure limb length discrepancy when there is a fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint? This is a practical question. Because if patient has a fixed flexion deformity and at the same time there is a limb length discrepancy, then we need to carry out a special technique while taking an x-ray so that we can actually see how much is the component of fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint and how much component is because of the true femoral or the tibial limb length discrepancy. So let's say that we saw that if this is the person lying on the table and there is a flexion deformity at the knee joint and we saw that this limb appears short. Though the length of the femur plus the length of the tibia is same, but because of the flexion deformity, it appears shorter. So in such case, if we really want to evaluate the patient, we need to carry out the x-rays in two parts. The first is we keep the patient in a prone position and then we measure the length of the, sorry, we measure the length of the femur. And then in the second part, we keep the 
leg in this position with the help of pillows. The green are the pillows to compensate for the flexion deformity. We make the both tibia parallel and then we take a x-ray and then we measure the limb line. And we add the length of the femur and then the length of the tibia. Coming to the third point, which is very important, that how does body manage limb length discrepancy? For that, there are various methods which body adopt, which is called compensation. So the first is, the first compensation is the pelvis tilt. The pelvis tilt on a shorter side. So the long leg hip abdu adducts and the short leg hip abducts. So this is the first compensation. The second thing which we see in the same direction, because there is a tilt of the pelvis, the spine will also have a bending. The second compensation is the ankle on a shorter leg will plantar flex and that will give some length because now the forefoot is touching the ground, the heel is up, but that will give us a length. Or the long side hip or knee will flex. So these are the compensations. Now one a very important point which is asked uh, by examiners, particularly those students who are doing really well, to then then examiner tries to ask them a tricky question. And this is one of the tricky question. We saw that scoliosis leads to limb length discrepancy in the apparent variety. We also saw that the limb length discrepancy also causes scoliosis as a compensation. So the next question or the important question, how can we differentiate whether it is apparent or it is a true problem which leads to the scoliosis? So scoliosis is primary or scoliosis is secondary? The answer to that question is examine the spine in a sitting position. So if scoliosis disappear, then we can conclude that the scoliosis which was seen on the examination was because of the limb length discrepancy. If scoliosis remains, then we can conclude that it is the primary spinal deformity which leads to scoliosis and which may be leading to limb length discrepancy. Coming to the last uh, important point, and that's the management. There are three frequently asked questions. The first question is why we should correct limb length discrepancy. Everyone should have a very clear cut idea about why to correct it. The second question which is asked when to correct. This is when question comes very important in a pediatric age group. And the third is how to correct it. So what are the ways for the correction? So let us understand the first point. What are the long-term effects of limb length discrepancy? We saw some of the compensation. So basically, this depends on the magnitude. If there is more limb length discrepancy, there are more compensation is required. And sometimes one compensation may not be adequate and the patient may use more than one um, type of compensation. So on one side, the person will use plantar flexion at the ankle joint. And on the other side, the person will flex hip and knee to compensate for the limb length. So it depends on the magnitude. When there is more limb length discrepancy, the compensation will be more. It also depends on the duration. If duration is longer, the body will have more changes and sometimes there are permanent changes also. And third is, it's very important to ask for the occupation. If person is having a standing or walking is much more required for the particular occupation, in that case, limb length discrepancy will have more effect. But on the other hand, person is a sedentary lifestyle. In that case, limb length discrepancy will not cause more problem. So effect of limb length discrepancy, 
the first it will have effect on the gait the second it may have a effect on the spine the third it may have a effect on the lower limbs and the fourth is the psychological effect let's see one by one what are the effect so let us understand the effect on gait when there is a limb length discrepancy naturally the person will limp this will increase the energy consumption because usually our body is designed in such a way that while walking there is a very little shift of center of gravity but because of limb length discrepancy there is a more shift of center of gravity while walking and that leads to more energy consumption while walking and because of that person will become tired very easily the second is the effect on the spine this may result into a scoliosis which is not actually permanent scoliosis but temporary scoliosis because of the pelvic tilt that may lead to back pain sometimes the scoliosis become permanent or there is a possibility that this may lead to accelerated degeneration of the disc of the motion segment and that may lead to a degenerative low back pain what can be the effects on lower limbs there may be a calf contracture on shorter side so every time body does not want to uh, like take the ankle into plantar flexion so there is a calf contracture so that ankle remains in plantar flexion and that is basically the body owns internal uh, method of compensating the limb length discrepancy we see this very commonly in polio sometimes because of equinus there is a more pressure on the fore forefoot and that may lead to a stress fracture of the foot bone it may lead to uh, osteoarthrosis of the knee joint on a longer side because longer side knee remains flexed while walking and that puts more loading on the patellofemoral joint and that may lead to more loading of uh, or the patellofemoral arthritis and that may cause osteoarthrosis of the knee as a whole it also causes osteoarthrosis of the hip on a longer side to understand this point let's see that there is a limb length discrepancy and this is what the situation is now if we look at closely the weight bearing portion on the left side is more while the weight bearing portion on the right side right hip is small which is shown in red we know that when the weight bearing portion is less the load on that particular part is more and that leads to earlier degenerative changes so if there is a limb length discrepancy like this the right side of the hip is likely to go for osteoarthrosis early limb length discrepancy and psychology usually we don't tends to look into that but there is always a inferiority complex to a person so whether person show it outward or not but always they have a psychological effect of that they they have some or the other element of inferiority complex about their body so this is what we discuss is basically a theory now there is always a difference between theory and the reality and let us understand like what are the evidence we have about the possibility which we discussed earlier so these are the few studies which i came across and which are very relevant to understand the long term effect this study was published in jbgs 2001 the study was carried out in a normal people so what the researcher did they give a compensation in the form of a shoe lift means they ask person to walk Uh, sorry so they gave a 1 cm compensation in the shoe then they asked the person to walk with 2 cm compensation then with 3 cm compensation and then they look at 
how much energy person is consuming while walking. So they found out that when limb length discrepancy is more than two centimeter, that leads to increase energy consumption while walking. And this can be seen as a perceived exertion means the person gets fatigued or exhausted early because person is consuming more energy while walking. They feel tired very early. This is very important, particularly for the person who is elderly, who has uh, some other morbid uh, component like a respiratory involvement or a cardiac involvement. And in those patients where the reserve capacity is less, limb length discrepancy really become a significant problem. But I, in a young person, there is no much problem because young people have a good reserve and slight increase in energy consumption does not make much difference in routine activity. The second study, again a very old study, 1970, sorry, 1991 study, which says that what is the relation between limb length discrepancy and low back pain? Whether the possibility of low back pain is more in people with limb length discrepancy? So they observe that up to 20 millimeter, that is 2 centimeter, that does not lead to more incidence of low back pain. Coming to another study, again slightly older, like 30 years old study, again they try to look at the limb length discrepancy and the relation with low back pain. This time they took a population which is having a unilateral Parthes disease. We know that in Parthes, the spherical femoral head become aspherical and there is a shortening. So they try to analyze that when there is a Parthes on one side, means there is a unilateral shortening that resulting into a limb length discrepancy. What is the effect? This is a very long term follow up, 28 to 47 year follow up a very significant study and they identified that even in untreated Parthes patient when limb land discrepancy was not taken care, the back pain was not present. Again, a different study in that they try to find out a reverse thing and they try to look in a low back population, uh, the people with low back pain, is limb land discrepancy a cause so what they did at meat market, the people who were working in a standing position or in sedentary workers, both were taken, say standing people and sedentary workers, and they look at the sick leaves due to low back pain. And they also look at the second component of the low back pain, that's how much severe the low back pain. Then they try to look whether in all these people, whether the limb length discrepancy is a cause of low back pain and they could not find any relation between the limb length discrepancy and low back pain. So again, they concluded that statistically, we cannot say that limb length discrepancy leads to low back pain. The another study, which is low back, uh, sorry, limb length discrepancy and effect of on the feet bone, whether they have more stress fractures. This was carried out in an army. 547 recruits with limb length discrepancy were analyzed. Now, this is very interesting that in India, if person has a limb length discrepancy, he is not allowed to join army. While other countries, they don't consider that as an exclusion criteria. So this is in Finland, they carried out this study. Basically, after joining the army, the person is usually given a training to walk long distance. And many of the recruits, they get a stress fracture. Now, they identified that 89% of the stress fracture were in a people who were having a limb length discrepancy more than 3 millimeter. And 
the stress fractures were both on longer and shorter side, but were more common on longer side. So again, based on that, we they they said that when there is a um, one limb is long, there is a more loading, and that may increases the possibility of stress fracture. But here, one should remember that this is for the army people who requires to run 20 kilometers in a day. For a normal person who hardly walks 3 to 4 kilometers a day, this may not be the cause of worry. Another study where they try to look at the limb length discrepancy and osteoarthrosis of the hip, 67 patients with the idiopathic osteoarthrosis of the hip were analyzed. Of this 67, 36 had significant limb length discrepancy. This osteoarthrosis in 80% of the patient was on longer side, but at the same time, 20% was on a shorter side. So we cannot all the time conclude that the osteoarthrosis will occur only on longer side. So I think uh, I will stop at this point because we will not like to go into the management part because of the lack of time. We will stop at that point and regarding the management, we will discuss later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dheeraj. Uh, as usual, I don't need to say it again. Very, uh, it shows a very clear approach to what you look for when you're examining patients with limb length discrepancy and then how you assess them. So I'm sure there must be a lot of questions and I would encourage uh, the DNB students and the PG students to ask questions because either you've understood everything or you've understood nothing. So one of the two. So someone's asking about this. What is significant limb length discrepancy? Yes, that's a very good question. What is a significant limb length discrepancy? So a limb length discrepancy, which is likely to cause long-term problems, is called significant limb length discrepancy. So any limb length discrepancy which is more than two centimeter will have effect on the gait, will have effect on the energy consumption, and there is a long term possibilities of osteoarthrosis at the hip or knee that is considered as a significant limb length discrepancy. Means you really you cannot neglect it. You need to do something for that. That's why it's called significant limb length discrepancy. So one oh, just related to this one, uh, how much of the limb length discrepancy we can manage with conservative management like sewage and all? And when, at what point we should consider it like uh, it can't manage without a surgery or? Yeah, Dr. Janki, that's a very important question. But uh, today we have not discussed about the management. So we discussed like what can happen, but when we should intervene, when we should manage and how we should manage that we have not discussed in this because that's again a very important point and I would not like to finish uh, that in hurry. So we will have next uh, session anytime uh, whenever you feel comfortable and convenient. We will discuss that point but that's a very important question both for practice and exam point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I think when the management is a completely different uh, thing which will not there are so many factors to be taken in before you decide on what you do. So, so, you, yeah. so uh, during your lecture, you have mentioned that that longer limb has more uh, loading. So, is that concept is because uh, while doing that THR and all, uh, like to keep it little shorter is okay, not the longer one. Is that is the concept, sir? While doing the THR and all. I think uh, Dr. John will be the better person than me <laughs> yes. to answer any question related to THR because so, my experience of THR is almost negligible. So basically in THR, you want to aim for a equal limb length. Okay, so That's the primary aim. But if you do err, it's better to err on the slightly shorter side than the slightly longer side because the ones with the lengthened limbs complain a lot more. Now, is this only because of loading or is there other factors involved? We don't know. Uh, one of the reasons is that they are usually used to walking with a shorter limb. And so if you over lengthen it, then it's 
usually a problem for them. Okay, so that's also a factor you need to take into account. But go for equal lengths. You have to try and equalize the lengths. But if you have to go on any side, it's better to be a little on the short side. But that doesn't mean you take two, three, four centimeters of shortening. You want to try to keep it as equal as possible. But don't so, lengthen because those patients are the most unhappy. Uh, so Jaswinder sir has also joined in the in between. And uh, one more thing, sir, about the as you have mentioned that osteoarthritis usually occurs in the knee joint. Is it that is more common in the shorter side or longer side? And why other joints are also getting affected or not, sir? Okay, so that's a very good question, and I would like to again explain that when there is a, like say, uh, if these are the two limbs, one is short, the other is long. So what body will do to make it equal, the longer side knee will flex. Now we all know the biomechanics that when knee is flex, particularly at patellofemoral joint, the loading is more than the knees in an extended position. So if knee is remaining in flex position during the stance phase, there will be more loading on the patellofemoral joint. And that from there, the osteoarthrosis will start. Usually we know that the loading starts at the medial side. But in this case, the loading, uh, sorry, the osteoarthrosis will start from the patellofemoral joint. And that may affect the medial compartment in a long run. But mainly it is, the patellofemoral joint, which is a problem because of the limb length uh, issue. So, uh, one more thing, sir, like when, while managing these cases, uh, sometimes uh, that joint line of the knee joint is not at the same level. So, is th that affect also, sir, or in the long run? Or yes, that that's, is that's, that's again a very important point that when the two knees are not at the same level, what is the long-term effect of that on walking uh, that we will discuss next time, but very important point. So the just one question on the studies you mentioned about low back pain. Uh, did they look at what the shortening was and does that make a difference? Because if yes. it's, a, if yeah, it's so one or two centimeters of shortening or five or six centimeters of shortening, could be a difference in that because the no, no, naturally. So see, magnitude of shortening is a very important point when we are trying to analyze this study. So two studies, they concluded that when it is less than two centimeter, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make much difference. And that is very important uh, yeah. when it comes to the management. And that's why we say that if it's less than two centimeter, you may not treat it or you just treat it with compensation. Yeah. So basically the rationale of that uh, uh, management is based on those studies which says that Less than 2 centimeter is not a long-term issue for low back pain also. So they were looking at less than 2 centimeters. 2 centimeter, yeah. yes. So yeah. it wasn't clear on that. Okay. So uh, when we are evaluating these type of cases, sir, usually that uh, AP x-rays or a scanogram is required. So what are, uh, even in those cases, do you write the lateral view also, sir, or just AP is okay? Okay, usually I uh, don't ask for literal view because uh, it costs. The cost of uh, these x-rays is around 2000 rupees. And when we ask for a literal view, again, that adds to the cost. So I don't ask for the literal view. So whatever segment is having a problem, uh, I take a, a literal view of that segment, but not of the whole knee. Yeah, so you can get a full length lateral view. If you're looking at slopes, et cetera, which you need to correct. But if it's just lengthening, it doesn't make too much difference. If it's just a limb length a discrepancy. So if it's a knee problem and you're planning to do some osteotomy, then definitely a long length lateral helps. But if you're planning to just do lengthening, then you don't need a long length lateral. But if the hip has a problem, yes, you will get a lateral of the hip. <clears throat> If you look at the book of Dror Pele, in almost all the patients, they have a lateral long leg film. Yes, that is possible in our setup, but uh, basically for that patient has to spend, and that's why I, I avoid taking 
uh, long leg film in all the patient. Only in some selected pa patients, like as uh, Dr. John said, uh, we, we can go for the long leg lateral view. Otherwise, we can take a X-ray, the lateral view of the hip joint or lateral X-ray of the femur or lateral X-ray of the knee joint, uh, not the complete long leg film. Yeah, Jaswinder, so, anything to add? Please unmute, sir. Yeah. We can't hear you still. Yeah. Please unmute, sir. Uh, yeah, he's unmuted, un but he can't be heard. Oh. Maybe. Uh, Jaswinder, we can't hear you. No, sir. No. Yeah, Jaswinder, you can also write in a chat box. Yeah, write it on the chat box. Yes. Uh, and everyone, sir, most of us have that some little bit of uh, like uh, limb length difference. So is that that is not a problem. So when we can consider that one, uh, like the two centimeter, what you have told is the uh, landmark for that one also. Sir. Yeah, it's a, that's a landmark. Like say, my professor, Dr. Kanaba, used to tell uh, when there is a fracture femur in a child, uh, when we remove the spica, the first thing parents will look is at the limb length. And at that time, uh, Dr. Kanaba used to say that 84% of the population, if you take uh, randomly 100 people uh, like who are walking normally on the road, and if you look at the limb length, 84% will have limb length discrepancy. So uh, what he was trying to say is that a minute amount of limb length discrepancy is not a problem. You can live normal life. It's only when it is about two centimeter, in that case, only we need to really be uh, concerned about the long-term issues. And then we need to think about uh, correction. So the other way of putting it is that very few of us have exactly the same length in both limbs. Yeah. Okay, so very minor differences are part of it and you get used to it and you do not uh, have to do anything about it except maybe uh, I mean, most of them don't even notice it and if they don't notice it you don't need to do anything about it. Uh, Dr. Jaswinder is asking about how do you convince patients for contralateral epiphysiodesis? Yeah, that's a very important point and we will discuss in the next that session Jaswinder because yeah, the, when, when it comes to treatment this is a very practical uh, point that I usually uh, tends to suggest patient that let's go for a contralateral epivisiodesis because it's a very easy procedure for doctor as well as for patient and for the family compared to limb length. But many times they don't get agree to uh, our suggestion and they say that don't do anything on the longer side. Whatever you want to do, do yeah, it on most a, patients. Uh, yeah. Shorter side. So, yes, that's a question and we will definitely discuss in the next session. So, yeah, and there are some issues in that as well. So, we'll uh, talk about it next time. So, yeah. Uh, one long, last thing, sir, like uh, during the examination, because limb length disturbance is quite important while uh, the measurement and all. So, a few things which is little confusing for the students, like how much of the FFD of the hip or knee is uh, com how much compensation in centimeter and all. So is that like 10 degree, what we we are taking for the hip, that is also okay for the knee, sir? Okay, I okay. have a very good pictures uh, about this and I will show it next time. I thought that it becomes too difficult uh, trigonometry. So I, I did not uh, discuss those slides, but yes, you have asked this question. So I will uh, include those slides next time. I think the angulation, length uh, uh, sort of correlation is uh, in the hip for abduction and adduction deformity. There's a generalized this thing, but uh, for flexion deformity, I'm not sure how you work it out. Yeah. So it may be interesting. Usually okay. it is not written, sir, but uh, in when it says like that same thing, uh, 10 degree for one centimeter for the I'm hip and sure they accept. That. Usually the examiner accept. No, no, I will explain that with very good pictures so that it becomes yeah. clear. I thought okay. that it's it's too much for postgraduates to understand trigonometry, so I did not include those slides. 
They probably understand trigonometry better than us, but yeah, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dhiran. Okay, that was yeah. excellent. And yeah. uh, great to see you again. And hopefully you'll keep adding to the value of this evening uh, webinars. Uh, sure. So until next time, bye. And bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Great, sir. And probably by next uh, oh, lecture, yeah. Jaswinder sir will be there. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, bye. Bye. Sure, bye.